I've got anything to say. All right, David. Come in. Hello, Ali. Yeah. Your note said 11. Yeah, I caught an early train. Came straight here. Yes or no? Where do I start? <sighs> I expected no. It started out no. I reread your Tom Mann on the train. A man who hates capitalism as much as you do can't be all bad. Marjorie, I shall need uh, another half hour or so. No, just take names. I'll call back. I'm still into Jim Wilkes, though. Oh, and um, I'll take the coffee now. Thanks. How about now? Fine. Why? Just the book? No. You're all we have. Yes. And it's now, isn't it? Yes. So it's you? Yes. Mr. Dalton's secretary rang. He thinks the liaison committee might meet late afternoon, depending on what the palace does. And Mr. Wilkes is back in the house. Mr. Dalton spoke with him ten minutes ago. Give him fifteen minutes. If he doesn't call, call him. Right. Okay. Yes. Here's a probable timetable of events. I'll take you through it. Tomorrow. Thursday. Noon. Watson's resignation posted. 2 p.m., Cabinet meets. Parliament reopens. Wilts asks the Speaker to suspend sitting pending a statement. 3 p.m., Queen sends for Wilts and asks him to continue pro tem as acting Prime Minister. Question mark, question mark. 4 p.m., Cabinet reconvenes, passes crisis measures, including heavy Bank of England intervention on behalf of desperately plunging pounds <laughs> and suspension of all dealings on the Stock Exchange until Monday morning at earliest. 5 p.m., Parliamentary Liaison Committee meets to draw up timetable for the leadership contest. We agree that balloting should begin the following morning at 11 a.m. and should be exhausted. Tell us to be elected, etc. Nominations by 10 a.m. Um, Friday, is that possible? If it's thought desirable, certainly. Mm -hmm. 5.30, meeting a Parliamentary Labour Party to ratify the Liaison Committee's recommendations. Early evening to early morning, factions. Chern Group picks its candidate. Friday morning, 11.30 a.m., results of first ballot. 11.30 a.m. to 1.30, canvassing for second ballot, etc., etc., etc. It's all possible. If it happens like that, I have a chance. No precedent. Without precedent, anything can happen. You've been busy, as have others. Do you want my reading? Please do. Kersley is unstoppable. Kersley's in America. He'll be back by tomorrow. Tomorrow might be too late. All right. Runners. Certain Venables. Kersley. Possibles, you, Brent, Coppel, uh, Morahan, I suppose, even Wilkes. Uh, Morahan's too old, okay, leave him out. Wilkes, two, no base. So, it's you, if the left will have you, against the rest. All 200 and plenty of them. The winner will be the man who can hold the centre. That's not Venables. That's not you. Is he calling me? Fine. Put him through, please, Marjorie. Wilkes. Jim, how's Arthur? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Yes, I'll try and see him tomorrow. Mm-hmm. 
It's still noon, is it? The, um... No, I think that's right. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Jim, um, just one or two thoughts. I've had a word with Rawlings and one or two of the others, and it does seem constitutionally that there is just the faintest chance that should appoint you pro tem as acting prime minister, and then at least explore the possibilities of sending for the leader of the opposition. Well, I, I say the faintest chance. Well, we are the biggest party. But we no longer have a majority over all other parties in the House. Well, then, offer it from what it's worth. But it does point out very sharply, I think, the need for expedition. I hope that we, we can both argue with this tomorrow at the Liaison Committee meeting. No, quite seriously, Jim. I do not believe that uh, the weekend is necessarily going to be ours to play around with. Just one more thing, Jim. Now, I've thought hard about this, and I, I want you to hear me out. I don't believe there is a natural successor to Arthur, largely because Arthur spent much of his time making sure there wouldn't be one. Now, this is a crisis for the country, for the government, and for the party. And I think it would be better for all three if all violent upheavals can be avoided. I think the proper thing is that you should be returned as leader. Preferably unopposed. I'll go further. If others will do likewise, I'll withdraw my own nomination. Precisely. Jim, I'm, I'm very glad we talked. No, no, not at all. Well, you have my numbers. Hmm? Oh, ours. Yes, please do. What then if we split the centre? By withdrawing? My withdrawal is contingent upon theirs. Neither would dream of withdrawing. By which time, with luck, Wilkes will have persuaded himself and his supporters that it's in the national interest that he should stand anyway. But he'll split the centre. And maybe let me in. But don't Wilkes vote to return to Kersley once he's eliminated? How can we possibly know that? None of us has ever played this game before. We don't even know the rules. We could wait forever and never find a better opening. There's one thing. Yes? Isn't it the only way for Venables too? If the revisionists get their hands on this party, that's the end of this party, right? Probably. So isn't Kersley preferable then? Yes, but I'm preferable to both. Yes? Mm -hmm. But if I'm to win, it's Venables I have to beat. Only if the party finds itself with that choice on Friday do I have a chance. See it? Yes, I see it. I don't like it. You think I do? I think it has to be done. We'd have two years to win the 80s for socialism. Kersley would have two years to convince the electorate that the management of capitalist economies is best left to the capitalists. Not a very difficult task for Kersley, I should have thought. All my political life, I've worked to shift this party to the left. In two days, we have the chance to move it further than it's moved in the past 50 years or more. That a chance we have the right to pass up. I'm asking you. Well, I can't answer. I'll have to think about it. No, Marjorie, I'll see him. I'll do it. Thank you. The Chief Whip. Help yourself. Um, come in, Cedric. One for Cedric, Bill, a scotch and a drop of water. Sit down, Cedric. Brandt's accepted my offer of uh, PPS, so you're among friends. Thank you. Do you want one? Thank you, now. Oh. 
Here we are. Yes. Bad. Could bring us down, David. Needn't. Ted Bullock's asked me to take some unofficial soundings. There's a feeling we're going to have to move fairly quickly and he won't be down until tomorrow. It'll save the PLP a little time. If we have some idea who's likely to be standing. I had a brief word with Kersley in New York. He'll be en route now. He will definitely stand. He's very strongly opposed to the idea of an early ballot. Doesn't see the urgency. Doesn't see it at all. He's a long way away. Venables will stand, come what may. He favours Friday for the ballot. Morahan's sleeping on it. That's to say he's busy seeing what his support is. A year ago, he was a man. But a year in politics, eh? <laughs> Which leaves you, David. I'm from early ballot. Friday. By tomorrow afternoon, the water could be up to our chins. We swim or go under. But you will stand. Not necessarily. Oh, what do you mean? I think a leadership struggle now, the state the country's in, would just tear the guts out of us. I think there's someone we can return unopposed this Friday. Who's that? Jim Wilkes. Jim Wilkes. Hmm. And you'd... what, withdraw? Give him the field? He's honest, middle of the road, respectable, experienced, dull, and he has a following. He's what we need. And if Kersley and Venables can't agree, then they must be made to explain why not. You think there's a chance they will agree, though? Why not? If I'm prepared to. They're both young men, their turn will come. We're talking about the life of a party and a government, Cedric. In that perspective, personal ambition is a miserable thing, is it not? Can I talk about this? By all means. Good. I'll toddle off, then. <clears throat> I've already spoken to Wilkes. Ah, good. He's thinking it over. I'll have a word with you. What's the uh, word on Arthur? Not good. Jim's just come back from the clinic, he'll uh, tell you. Uh -huh. Congratulations, young man. Uh, though whether your boss here will have a job by Monday, something else entirely, eh? <laughs> or any of us, come to think of it. Mr. Freer rang. He left a number. Thanks. Freer? Freer's Venables, ma'am. We're in touch. You're enjoying it? No. I'll do what I have to do. Ends, always and only, justify means, if the ends are large enough. Lenin? Tom Mann, born Warwickshire, 1856. Did he buy it? <laughs> buy it? He came to sell it. Maddox is a Wilkes man from way back. They both came into the house together. Railway clerk and docker, comrades in arms, hugging the centre like drunken drivers after the cat's eyes. Wilkes sent him here to check it out. If Wilkes gets it, he gives Cedric a ministry. The question is, did he know I knew he knew? It's pathetic. Yes, very. Glad you said yeah. <laughs> I think I'm glad you asked me. Hello, Bill. 
<laughs> Jim, you're taking it then, eh? Yes. Picked an odd time, didn't you? I wish you luck, comrade. Something to say? Why you, do you think? Again and now? Tell me. Don't you know? <coughs> I know what he told me, and it's hardly calculated to impress the right with the maturity of his political judgment. It's not the right your appointment's intended to impress, Bill. He needs us. Right. Oh. Your role is emblematic. He's a very clever man. Darling, comrade, any chance of a hand? Hello, Tom. How are you? Fine, son. Fine. Just ship me that chair so I can slip in beside you with this thing. <laughs> Yeah. Good turn out. I thought you weren't supposed to be up for another month. Oh, well, you know what I thought it, don't you, lad? It potted a muck cart and thought it was a wedding. <laughs> I'd say bloody Watson out anyway. And who in, Tom? That's what I've come to find out, isn't it? Meeting has begun. As chairman of the journal group, I think I might be permitted a few words by way of introduction to this evening's deliberations. First, the constitutional position. We are still the government of this country. By tomorrow evening, the party will have chosen by due process our new leader. It will then, in my opinion, be the duty of the Queen, and I use the word duty advisedly. In my view, she has no area of discretion whatsoever in the matter. It will then be her duty to send for that person and appoint him Prime Minister. And if, instead, she sends for someone else not of this party, God will indeed have his work cut out to save her. <laughs> Comrades, these are grave times. Country, government, party face the most enormous problems. Now, whether we call it the agonised death struggle of late capitalism or something less hysterical, it is vital that the left, at least, Keep its head, its nerve, its heart in working order. Let me say this and then I'll sit down. The best outcome of this meeting would be the unanimous nomination of a single candidate wholly assured of the total voting strength of this group. I, I don't, of course, in any way wish to preempt the search for that person, but at the end of the day, whoever it is should be able to count on a united left in tomorrow's ballots. That's what this group is for. Let's prove it works. What's the latest information on the uh, field, Reg? Would comrades mind standing when speaking? Oh. Well, it's a crowded room. I think it will help at this particular historical conjunction. Oh. Comrade Chairman, I think it's important we should consider the other runners when deciding who to enter. Is uh, Jim Wilkes in or out, for instance, do you know? Venables and Kersley are in. Wilkes, I don't know about. He's been busy in cabinet most of the day. But as far as I know, he has not as yet made up his mind. What mind? No. Oh. I, must, I must say, Comrade Jim... Mind standing, please, come. I'm sorry, oh, Comrade. Really? I must say I find the whole Wilkes business difficult to comprehend. Oh. I mean, can I ask for a kick-off whether Comrade Last's announcement that he would withdraw in favour of Wilkes if others did was discussed at all with you, Comrade Chairman, or with anyone in the group? Yeah. Nothing has been discussed with me, Comrade. Has David Last gone bananas or something? <laughs> Since when has Jim Wilkes been a friend of the left, for Christ's sake? He was a statutory incomes policy man the last I heard Through of. Through the yeah. chair, please, yeah. Comrade. Through the chair. <laughs> Tell you what I resent, Reg. I resent David Last's assumption in this Wilkes business. I mean, namely, that he already has the entire left vote in his pocket to trade with as he thinks fit. Yeah. Yes. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's very far from being the case. I couldn't agree more, Mr Chairman. I don't think I'm alone in finding the Minister of Employment's record in office somewhat uninspiring. <laughs> Speaking personally, I think we should be examining other records and credentials. Trevor Brent, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. If it's a good left record in office we're looking for, then I submit that Trevor Brent, particularly in his work with the trade union movement, has much to commend it. Well all right, all right, all right, comrades. Hold your horses, hold your horses. I thought I saw Wally Armfield here. Now, 
Could you throw light on whether Comrade Brent would be prepared to stand if nominated? I understand that Trevor will be here presently. I'll prefer to leave it till he comes. I spoke with him this morning. He indicated to me then that he would be unwilling to stand. Do you know if that's still the position? Uh, the minister has been in cabinet most of the afternoon. We've barely spoken. So? Well, as I understand it, that certainly was the position this morning. Thank you. It is possible, comrades, in all this frothy chat about personalities, we'll forget to talk about politics. Now, what are we talking about? We're asking who should represent the left in the coming leadership struggle. But there is a prior question. Does a left candidate stand a chance of winning given the present composition of the Parliamentary Labour Party? Now, we rush into tactics before we've assessed the nature of the battle. So, can we win? Yes. Out of a vote of 300, odd, how many can we count on? 80? 90? Venables will pull the same. Maybe more, maybe less. Kersley will take the rest. Now, we could lose on the first ballot. But even if we won, how can we possibly eat into Venables supporters to beat Kersley on the second? Now, if Kersley was a wholly bionic man who had to go on a trickle charge after every cabinet meeting, they'd make him leader before one of us. So what are you saying, Winnie Love? Several things, Dicky Love. I'm saying one. Do we put up a candidate at all? Yes, of course we do. Two. If we do, it should be the second and deciding ballot we should be discussing here tonight. Right. Not the third. And three. If we cannot win, why should we automatically assume that the left candidate should already be a member of the government? Now, David Last is a comrade. Let that be quite clear from the outset. But three years in government have taken their toll. Now, it makes it not a whit better that he is honourable, brave and uncorrupt, because on the left, these are expectable virtues. But what does matter is that in certain important respects, he has done the right's dirty work for it, comrades, and has been seen to do so by the constituency Labour parties, themselves overwhelmingly left. Now, if we have no reasonable expectation of victory at this particular historical conjunction, <laughs> should we not see to it that we're at least represented by someone who most nearly matches our idea of what a socialist leader should be like? Yeah. Now, not to put too fine a point on it, I believe that David Lars should not receive the nomination, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but someone else. And just to start the ball rolling, I nominate Comrade Starr. Uh, if I could make my position clear, comrades. I was approached last night by a dozen or so members of the group to see if I would be willing to stand for nomination. I answered quite simply that I would stand if and only if one. It was the express desire of the journal group that I should stand and two, that my standing would do nothing to damage or divide our democratic faction. Shall we proceed, comrades? <coughs> Tom? I have no intention of treating you to an extended peroration, comrades, so you can relax. Three minutes in this position is about my limit, just for the moment. And uh, I'm not about to cross swords with Winnie Scola. What I will say, though, is that while it's an interesting enough analysis she's offered, it's not necessarily a correct one. Mm -hmm. For example, what if Jim Wilkes does decide to stand out of peak ambition, a genuine desire to serve the party, whatever, it doesn't matter. If the right and centre can be induced to split to our advantage, that's a new ball game, as they say, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is Kersley so impregnable then? I honestly believe we should fight as if we mean to win. And that means, no disrespect to you, Reg, we must put up our most politically and electorally credible candidate. Yeah. Who, unless things have changed drastically since I went sick last September, is David Last. Yeah, yeah. But uh, if I can go on a moment longer, comrades, I believe his nomination should be conditional upon his furnishing us with some fairly detailed outline of the way he would handle matters as PM and leader of the party, because 
If this is the sort of attention he's going to pay the organised left wing in power, it's going to be a bloody sorry show for everyone concerned. Right. Uh, perhaps you could tell us something of his whereabouts. Um, thank you, Comrade Chairman. Uh, Comrade Last was meant to be here directly the Cabinet broke. I have a note here to say he's been detained, but will be here shortly. Uh, might, might I be allowed a word or two more, Comrade Chairman? By all means, Comrade. Thank you, Comrade Chairman. Uh, I speak as Bill Brand, a member of this group. Uh, not as junior campaign manager or apologist for David Last. It seems to me there are two distinct, though interconnected, areas of problematic. Um, Comrade Schooler touched on the first, can we win? Comrade Mapson on the second, win to do what? The first clearly depends, as Tom says, on whether or not the right and centre can be induced to split to our advantage. Now, we're not likely to be in full possession of all the facts on this until tomorrow morning, but so long as Jim Wilkes remains a possible candidate, we have a chance of pulling it off. Now, think what that means, comrades. <clears throat> but if we win to become prisoners of the right of the revisionists, we'll have won for nothing. So, comrades, the question we should be addressing ourselves to this evening is... How can we win for something? That's to say, how can we make the victory political rather than factional, a victory for socialism over reformism? The only genuinely political reason for offering someone our nomination would be if that person, man or woman, were to commit publicly to the kind of social and economic program we as a group were prepared to endorse. Yeah. Welcome, comrades. Um, I'd like to push in a little. I think there's a bit of room for you up here. Apologies for late, Miss Reg. We'll squeeze in when the comrades finish speaking, if that's all right. As you wish. Comrade. <clears throat> speaking for myself, I'm very clear what a socialist government's priorities must be in this present crisis. Some facts. In the last year, under a Labour government, unemployment has risen to close on one and three quarter million. Seven percent of the total workforce is now jobless, and the graph continues to rise. In that same period, the average employee has experienced a six percent reduction in real disposable income under a Labour government. In that same period, Industrial output, that's wealth-producing output, comrades, has continued to plummet. In that same period, the current account balance of payments has continued to deteriorate. It now stands at two billion in deficit. Now, comrades, unless we can solve these problems, and I don't mean simply encant magical socialist slogans over them and wait for them to disappear. Unless we can solve these problems, we will not be fit to govern. I don't know Comrade Last's thinking on all of this, but I'll give you mine. <clears throat> As Trevor Brent and others have consistently pointed out, industry and the stock market will not undertake the investment this country needs. As a nation, we need £6 billion per year for capital investment in manufacturing, double what is currently being spent. So, whether through the National Enterprise Board or through new institutions to be created overnight, if necessary, we must make these sums available at relatively low rates of interest so that at a stroke... We begin to reverse the trend in unemployment with still more jobs to follow as the new investment bites. Of course, um, in the short term, we add to the already enormous government borrowing requirement, but this time we make sure that this reflationary money goes into production rather than consumption. That's to say, into factories instead of extra houses. Yes, comrades. 
These are the iron contradictions. Face them into extra machines, not extra cars, into extra product, not extra services. And, 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 and if this, this, this rapid growth in money supply proves to be inflationary as it's bound to, a socialist government must be prepared at once to introduce a system of special deposits, uh, uh, similar to the one used just after the war, whereby a sizable proportion of all bank deposits are compulsorily frozen with minimal interest rates. As we must oblige life insurance and pension funds to invest a fraction of their money in industry, if necessary, by direct intervention. <clears throat> of course, uh, industry could not expect to receive these low interest loans from the state for nothing. The new lending institutions would need to be empowered to explore the taking of equity or of direct ownership and the requirement of all borrowers that acceptable models of workers' control be immediately established in their particular enterprises. Right. <clears throat> oh, there's the bones of it, comrades. It's my view that whoever gets our nomination should commit himself to putting flesh on them. Thank you, Comrade Graham. <coughs> I think, if I may, I'll make use of chairman's privilege and call upon David Last to speak. David? Pass me up that chair. Come with me. Thank you very much. Say at the outset, David, that there is some feeling in the group that you are no longer the automatic choice for left candidate. Furthermore, nomination of another group member has already been lodged, though not as yet seconded. Thank you, Reg. You've uh, missed out Trevor Brent, Reg. Are we to understand from what we've just heard that uh, Trevor would be unwilling to stand if asked, or what? Oh, forgive me, Alf. I must be getting old. <coughs> I've uh, given the matter much thought, Chairman, and I've spent hours discussing my position with David, uh, Edna, and others. I can see no useful purpose being served at this juncture by allowing myself to be put forward. I believe David Last to be the only person capable of leading us to victory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I trust his socialism implicitly. Comrades, I have very little to say, except perhaps good to be home. <laughs> Tired? No, are you? Not so I could sleep. Oh. Not for the draw, huh? <clears throat> No, no, not now. I've always found drawers unreal somehow. The unions didn't exactly offer you unqualified endorsement on the tonight thing, did they? Stayed clear of everyone. That's all I asked of them. Moores and Wigan, I mean. I didn't want them lining up in public behind Kersley. <laughs> Kersley almost hemorrhaged when Venables announced he was in favour of Wilkes being returned unopposed. You, on the other hand, never batted an eyelid. The problem is that he only expects the expectable. Your clock? Oh. 
All right. I'll give you the draw. <laughs> I'll accept your resignation. Where do you learn this? I taught myself. A long night spent with books filled with great games and commentary. Morphy, Anderson, Retty, Capablanca. Another. Shouldn't you sleep? No. Oh, I need to keep awake. Two each. Decider. Ah. Hmm. I wonder what they're doing now. Venables and Kersley. No idea. Hate to think. <laughs> Sleeping, both of them. Venables will have prayed rather hard to God. Kersley will have knocked back several Mogadon cocktails. As it happens at the moment, neither matters. Hope Jim Wilkes sleeps well. Dreaming of power. Dreaming of something. the names in alphabetical order. Kersley, Morris, 83. Last, David Russell, 81. Venables, John Winston, 85. If colleagues could just contain themselves, Wilkes, James, 61. Is it your wish that the tellers remain the same? Aye. Thank you. I declare that Messrs. Kersley, Last and Venables shall go forward to a second ballot to be cast at 1.30pm. Um, Will the tellers stay behind, please? Thank you. Well, Jim, I hope you're bloody satisfied. I did what I had to do, Morris. Don't be so dim, man. You've been used! See it! For Christ's sake! Bloody idiot! Dear, dear, dear. Morris is having trouble remembering he's a gentleman. Again? You've got under two hours. Who's it going to be? Kersley or Wilf? No. Cedric Maddox. Preferably in his office. I'll be upstairs. Sorry you were kept waiting, David. It's been a busy hour. I thought if Bedrick Graham came along, he has fast legs. Well, I hadn't expected... Um... But everything that passes between us is wholly confidential. We all know that. Yeah. May I? Please. Well, David, what can I do for you? I want to talk votes, Cedric. With me? With you. I'm flattered. Talk on. I tried to see Jim Wilkes. He's seen nobody, I understand. Isn't he? I suppose he's a little upset. Quite naturally, in the circumstances. I hear that Kersley's offered his apologies for what happened. Word has it that Jim's refused to accept them. 
He's a proud man. Do you happen to know if Jim intends to advise his supporters on how they might cast their votes in the second ballot? We've discussed it briefly, yes. All right, Cedric, I'll tell you how I see things and then I'll leave you if you wish, all right? By all means, David. Can I get you a drink? Oh, thank you, no. Young man, I'll have a small gin, Jeremy, and a tonic water, I think. Sure, David. <laughs> Tell me how you see things, and I'll tell you whether to go away. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeremy. Help yourself. I take 30 of Jim Wilkes' 61 votes to be personal to Jim. The rest come in ratio of roughly 3 to 2 casually to variable. Now, let's concentrate on those 30, say, for the moment. What are their options? They can vote for Venable, but that's not very likely. He's too far to the right, with a view of the party very alien to their own. Or they can vote for Kersley, who has just insulted and humiliated their candidate in public, and who would make the sacking of Jim Wilkes possibly his first act in office. Or they vote for me. That's novel. Perhaps, but not without a certain elegance. Especially since I offered to withdraw in their candidate favour. But didn't. Wasn't allowed to. Is that all, the only reason? No. They can rest assured, if I am returned to power, that Jim Wilkes will continue to make a contribution in high office. Hmm. How high? Well, I'm not sure that I can answer that. You can hardly expect... I expect nothing, David. Shall we say, Deputy Prime Minister? Hmm. Yes. and leader of the house. Can rest assured, you say, do you mean, um, they'd have your word? They'd have my word. Hmm. How are you, young man? Feel like a bit of sprinting? Fine, fine. Good, good. It's 28, actually. <laughs> I take it that I'll be Remembered in dispatches, David? Of course. Not that it matters that much anymore. I begin to weary. Take the bottom half, you take the top half. Meeting in room eight. Uh, 115, prompt, all of them. Tick, tick, gentlemen. Can you have a drink now, David? Uh, thank you, no, Cedric. There are one or two people I have to see. Good luck. Comrade. Thank you. Tick, tick, Jeremy. Cedric, just left. Buy it? He came to sell it. <laughs> Room 8, 115. Oh! Ah! <laughs> Kersley Morris, 99. Last, David Russell, 106. Venables, John Winston, 104. Oh. I declare that Messrs. Last and Venables shall go forward to a third ballot to be cast at 3.30 p.m. No. There's no way, David. No bloody way. You're too clever by half. You ought to have been in the city. You'd have cleaned up. Morris, for God's sake, let's talk politics. He will destroy this party. Your party, mine. And split the movement from which we both came. No, no. You've heard him. You've read him. You know him. He wants to separate this movement from his trade union base and launch it on a sea of floating voting consumers. Rhetoric, David. Two weeks as leader, dealing with the unions, and all his verbiage won't be worth the air it came on. He'll bend to reality like everyone else. Like even you, huh? You don't mean that. Well, of course I bloody believe Shit, it. Morris! You wrote an article only last month in Socialist Commentary 
Attacking Venable's views on reorganizing the movement and the party. What do you mean, he bent to reality? You wouldn't recognize our versions of reality if you hit him in the face with them. Venables can be handled. I happen to know that. He's offered already, you mean? Let's just leave it, David. You mean you're preparing to sell this party down the river for the sake of your own career? No, I'm not. And I'd like you to retract that. All right. How would you put it, then? I'm asking you for an apology. All right. I apologize. All right. All right, Morris. Let's hear it, Morris. Let's hear it. I'll tell you this last, and then I'll go. The reasons, none of them shameful, that I'll be giving my supporters for not supporting you are as follows. First, a government led by you would invoke economic chaos, social disorder, political massacre, and electoral suicide. Second, Venables has the public charisma capable of defeating the Tories at the next election. And thirdly, in any government formed by Venables, the interests of my section of the party would be fully represented in terms of office, with myself as Foreign Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister, which is why I'm able to reject your alarmist views that Venables would be looking for an all-out confrontation with the unions. And uh, in the absence of any at least commensurate offer from you, I believe that those reasons will be decisive enough to sway my supporters in the direction best suited to serve the country's needs and the parties and the governments. And in the unlikely event that these three reasons should prove insufficient, I shall be forced to produce a fourth, potentially the most decisive. If you are returned as leader of a party with no overall majority in the House, I don't believe for one moment that the Queen would be advised to send for you. John Venables is now our only chance of continuing in power at all. And now I'll go. But this is written up in the histories, comrade. I hope you get the attention you deserve. <laughs> and you too, comrade. We've lost them. To the house, please, Jan. I've got to see Red Star and one or two others. Jan can take you on home or no, wherever. No, 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 I'll come. Fine. He's asking us all to stay on. Partly because of the financial crisis. Partly for the unity of the party. Will you? Yes. Why? Because that's where the fighting's going to be. Oh, I must ring home. I rang. Did you consider topping Venable's offer to Kersley? Yes. Why didn't you? One, as Chancellor or Foreign Secretary, the only post he'd been prepared to accept, he'd have been in a position to sabotage any socialist program we tried to introduce. Two, I'd already promised them to Trevor Brent and Edna Koppel as quid pro quos. Take a pick. I don't believe the offer itself was it. What then? I truly believed I wouldn't be sent for. So my offer couldn't be made good. You really believed she had the power. Believed it. 
And yet, objectively, she sat there and never moved a finger. Power indeed, hmm?